tones. <clears throat> and we're, we've sort of been moving right along and even skipped sections because many of you have the book and you could actually do what we call read it, yeah, in your spare time. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, one reason why I wrote these books and, made, and many of the books that I did write for the Bible school and the ones that have study questions was so that the teachers, the, they would have be the basic information and whoever taught could teach what they've seen and you could read the stuff, okay. Well, just to, just to be honest with you, in reading over um, some in this book, <clears throat> I realized that um, this was written a long time ago. Jeez, now that I remember writing it, it was a long time ago. Um, I don't, think, I don't think the information is wrong, but I think some of the terminology that I used here I wouldn't have used, and I think that probably 10 years from now, if I read what I wrote now and made the changes, there would probably be <clears throat> some changes to it. Um, that being said, that means <clears throat> that everything I say and write is not perfect. Yeah, I know. Um, however, I will confess to the fact that I love Jesus and that I am in pursuit, in genuine pursuit, and that I want to know the Lord. And I don't, I, you know, anything I share for the most part has been things that I have spent time before the Lord because I really wanted to know the Lord in these areas. <clears throat> and um, so... Um, as always, search the scriptures, read whatever I give you, listen to whatever class, but always do it looking to the Holy Spirit because he's the only one that knows Jesus. I'll, I'll even say it almost like this correctly. None of us else, no, nobody else knows him correctly in the sense of his fullness and, and his ways and all of this, all of this. <clears throat> and... Um, so, um, so we're going to be again in chapter three, and it's, the title of it is chastisement. And we have Jonah as the example. And uh, and most of these chapters throughout this book, we give someone as an example. <clears throat> and um, and I will say that um, um, some some that are probably pretty new in the scriptures or have who have not studied a lot would easily categorize Jonah under chastisement. <clears throat> However, others who were spending time in the Word and with the Lord might question that he should be under chastisement, under the category of chastisement. <clears throat> I personally believe that he definitely belongs here, but not with most people's definition of what, what chastisement is. That I think that there is a completely different understanding from the word and from the Lord pertaining to this. And uh, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna start in Galatians. Um, in Galatians chapter four, <clears throat> so that I can sort of prep this class. Oh, by the way, this, uh, I was told because I was in Ireland and I had other things going on that I only have six two-hour two classes and that if you, it's almost like if you went through the chapters, I wouldn't have enough if I could do one every chapter. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to re-ask you to read the book, <laughs> to read the book. All right, Galatians chapter 4. Um, and I want you to notice in our reading here a, a um, usage of the word child and the use of the word son. And the reason why they are used in, in the same set of scriptures is because um, there, are, there are two different Greek words. The word child is from the Greek word teknon. And it means, basically, it means one immature. So that would, that would mean that you could be a child and be, uh, you know, 40 or 
20 or, you know, yeah, 80. <coughs> but the word son is the word huios, and it relates to um, maturity or a child coming to an understanding of the father's heart. And therefore, he is considered now a son, not just a child. So let's read this. <clears throat> Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, okay, so he's talking about an heir. He's talking about, if you, if you made this a family affair, he's talking about someone in the family, okay? Someone in the family. <clears throat> now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, meaning he is the heir of all that the Father has. But in his immaturity, he differs the way that he is. He differs no, no different than a, a servant, uh, meaning one who <clears throat> goes by the rules or is supposed to go by the rules. That's what a servant does. You go do this, don't do that fix this at a certain time, do so and so, da 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 Okay, so that's a servant. Well, that's also many people who are under the law. <clears throat> and it is also many people who would not think that they're under the law, but their view of how to relate to the Lord um, is based on what to do and what not to do. Okay. Now, let me, let me just say a few things about that. <clears throat> uh, you don't have to agree with me on this. <clears throat> and, uh, but I, I, what I feel that I have seen, and, you know, I could be wrong, but I, what I feel that I have seen is that, that this is not about... Uh, doing the right thing or not doing the right thing. And that was one of the problems I had when I was reading this, some of the terminology, as a matter of fact. I, <clears throat> in a, quite a few places, especially like with chastisement, uh, I would use the word obedience or disobedience. Now, some of you have read my newsletter from probably about a year ago, maybe a little less, where I dealt with obedience for four, four or five newsletters and showed that the true obedience for a New Testament believer is obedience unto death, okay? <clears throat> and, I, and I gave tons of scriptures, including Romans uh, 6 and, and um, uh, Philippians and all that. <clears throat> uh, but but that, that I would have used different words now because those words to me now imply that I do the right thing or I'm not doing the right thing. Okay, now, now here's the deal. I, I believe that the, there is a doing of the right thing or not the right thing, but I believe that the right thing is Christ and the not doing of it is not Christ. Yeah, I mean to do the right thing is to be motivated by the life of Christ. To do the right thing is life, the tree of life as opposed to the tree of the knowledge of what you didn't do or what you did do, good and evil, okay? All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the pursuit of the believer is to know Jesus and to be conformed to that image so that what comes out of us is the life of the body. We're the body of Christ. What comes out of us is the God of the temple. We're the temple. What comes out of us is the uh, fruit of of the vine, not the fruit of the branch. On and on and on. This, what comes out of us is the treasure, not the earthen vessel. I mean, we can just keep, you know, we can just keep going at all the examples that point to this reality. The reality is, is that <clears throat> God wants his son out of us, and that may look like to some people that you're keeping the law because you're doing the right things. But you're not keeping the law to do the right things. You're living by Christ. Well, and, those, pardon? Those same people would get confused <clears throat> when you do something that walks out of step with that. Right. But that is still under the spirit of Christ. Right. Life of Christ. Right. 
Well, well, Jesus is a total example of that because they were, you know, you're healing on the Sabbath and you're, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And he was living by this principle, except the father was, he said, the father in me does the works. So that when they said, well, you healed on the Sabbath, he said, I didn't do it, the, the father did it. Okay, yeah, well, it wasn't, it really, you know, it, it sounds like blame him, but the truth is, it is, it is, he, he is, Jesus is at Sabbath, he's at rest, he's not doing the work. So he's actually fulfilling the Sabbath, you know, and more importantly, he's the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath. Okay. <clears throat> Holy Spirit has to show you and me and, you know, I've got much to learn myself. And I'm telling you what I believe concerning these things, that I believe that the law was all about doing the right thing or not doing the right thing. It was totally about that. It was totally about that. God's up here and he says, do this thing, and if you do it, I'll bless you, and if you don't do it, I'll curse you. But the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit don't operate on that basis. You know, they're not going, now you better do the right thing. You know, they are the right thing. <laughs> and they are in us the right thing. All right, well, that's my belief, and I don't, you know, I don't hear a whole lot of people on TV sharing that <laughs> from that angle. So that means that I'm probably wrong. <clears throat> but, but it's up to you to search the scriptures to find out if, it's, if what I'm saying is correct. <clears throat> and um, you know, part of what Romans 7 is all about is someone who's trying to do the right thing and the harder they try to do the right, when I would do good, then evil comes. The harder they're trying to do the right thing, the more they mess up. But then he says, you know, oh, wretched man that I am, who? Now he's looking to a who, not a, not a, 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 a record, a, a, a tables of stone with answers or, you, you know, the right thing to do. Because he was trying that and failing. Okay. So, <clears throat> who? shall save me from this body of death. <clears throat> and Christ saves us, not just saves us from hell, not just saves us from punishment. He saves us from us. And that's the biggest salvation you could ever have. It's the biggest salvation that you could have. And he saves us in a million ways. Peter walking on the water, and he starts sinking. And, and he says to Jesus, save me, okay? There's a salvation right there, okay? Um, he got his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at the storm. Anybody ever done that before? Okay. We have, we have Lindsay and Jesus are the only two. <clears throat> but, but, okay, so, so all of us, many of us have done that, but but how many of us have seen it in the right context and said, Lord, save me by your life? And um, so, so anyway, I didn't want to go off on that a whole lot. But so let's finish this. Now I say that the heir, even though he's in the family, even though he's born again, uh, though, he, though he is yet a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. But he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, okay? And the tutors and governors are spoken of here in the context of um, the law. They are teachers and uh, child trainers. But you can train a child and that not make him a son. You can, you can spank a child and that doesn't make him a son. It makes him a spanked child you know. okay <clears throat> um, as, as most parents know you know see I don't have to explain anything to them okay <laughs> they're with me you know and the rest of you you figure it out all right uh, but notice the phrase until the, the appointed time the father and the emphasis of the father with the child okay 
Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Now we're using the word son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And the word adoption there doesn't mean, gosh, you know, just trying to explain anything takes hours, you know what I mean? But the word adoption there is not your regular word for adoption. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take somebody outside my family and adopt them. That's American adoption or pretty much any kind of adoption except this one. This kind of adoption, the very name means son placing. And it is taking a child and placing them as a son. It is their own child. And it is a work of the father who has recognized in them We'll, we'll call it right now maturity until we get to the next verse. Okay. <clears throat> verse 6. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son, this one capitalized, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay. So he's declaring now that you are a son, be, and there is this joint work of God. You're, you're in the family, so you're born again, but he's sending forth the spirit of his son, not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out of a father. So this is a father-son relationship happening in you, happening in me, okay? And so uh, verse 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant or no more a child, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God, through Christ. We always leave that out. It's amazing how much, many times Christians leave that out and go, then I'm an heir of God because now I'm mature. Well, clearly you're not because you said it like that. <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, you need to see that this must be Christ. And this goes back to our thing. Okay, having said all that and, and not explained anything, let's go now to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Yeah. Since I am a failure as a teacher, a man of God, a father, and a husband, let us move on to perfection. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this Hebrews chapter 12, did I say that? Okay, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. All right, so we're going to read here the longest dissertation on the subject of chastisement in the Bible. Okay, it's all about that. So I want you to follow the line here. Verse 5, Hebrews 12, 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto sons. Now my translation translated that sons, but uh, let's see. Let me just double check. I'm almost positive that that is Tignon there. Gosh, I can't even find it. Pardon? In verse five, yeah. It's okay. So I, w I wonder, I must have been translated in the King James children. But anyway, my translation, which says sons also, speaketh unto you sons, my son, my son despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay. What I want you to notice is that he is recognizing him as a son, but he's recognizing that he needs maturity. Okay, that's important. Uh, and I want you to notice how, how often he uses the, that with chastisement, the issue is sonship. The issue is becoming a son. Now for you ladies, you're a son of God by Christ. For uh, you men, you're part of the bride of Christ. Okay, we're all even. Can we just now get along? Okay. <laughs> All right. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Okay. So this is the father seeing this one as a son and is working toward that end. He doesn't see his actions as that or he wouldn't be scourging. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? He's, it, it's, you know, I tell people, you know, I try to go by God's view of you that he gives me 
of who you are in Christ. And I try to, I try to relate to people on that basis instead of the way that they are outwardly. It works really well. It keeps you from murdering or <laughs> things like that. And it, and it keeps your eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> I believe that's what's going on here is the father is seeing them in son and knows that they are meant to be a son and is receiving them as a son and therefore he is chastising them or as it were bringing them into what they are. Because you are that in Christ. But you don't act like it because I've seen some of you. <clears throat> All right. But he wants, to bring, he wants to bring you into living as a son. Amen? All right. And notice that whom he loves. This is a love thing with him. All right. So now let's ask the question. Why is he chastising this son? Why is he doing this? Well, he's chastising them because they're wrong. That's, that would be the normal answer. He's chastising them because they're wrong. But to, the Father is not about right and wrong, good and evil. So he's doing it to bring them into fullness of sonship by Christ. Very important. By Christ. He wants Christ formed in you. Paul says, I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you. He doesn't say, I travail in birth till this church gets it right. You know, I'm a prophet, and I see sin in this church, so, you know, so I'm going to prophesy right into you. No. No. What they need is Christ, an increase of Jesus. And it'll solve so much concerning pride or sin or all the things that cause us to um, go astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. What does that mean? We've heard it a million times. Well, we left the Lord and we got into sin. No. No. And I, I yes, yeah, somewhere there's a teaching on this. But the point is that the going astray is that they, those sheep were dedicated to the altar and they have left the altar. They've left the place of going to the altar and now they're just living as happy little sheep in a pasture. Hello. Every sheep in Israel, every one of them could possibly be sent to the altar. Okay. And that's why the shepherds primarily raised them. For all of the worship in the temple and all of the, you know, all of it representing the slain lamb, all of it representing Christ crucified and our union with him. <clears throat> ah. So, if ye endure, and the, here's the thing, if you endure, I'm, I'm going to say it like this, if you endure father dealing, oh man, see that's different, father dealing. You know, it's not just uh, someone with a whip or a belt or a, you know, a hand to slap you from the dinner table or something like that. It is father dealing to bring forth son in a son. Bring forth the son. And because your sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son. That's what he wants in us. The spirit of his son in us. And that spirit will not say, me, me, oh God. You know, that's a child. And that's understandable. A child says, can I, what can I get? Can I get one of that? They go to the Walmart and they go, you know, can I have one? Can I get this? Can I get this? You know, and you look around and they, they're carrying all this stuff and you're going, put that back. <laughs> you know? And I know that for a fact because I took Grace and the twins with Cassie and Deb to, um, to Target. And that was the case. They're walking around with stuff and, you know, just, you know, having a big time. And you're having to distract them. Oh, look over there. You know, one. 
All right. Let us read on then. Um, so if you endure chastening or father dealing, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So do you see how much already? We just read a few verses here. And it's you, son, 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 father, father. And it's going to continue to do that for many verses on down. Okay, verse 8. But if you, if you be without chastisement, of which all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons? Okay, meaning that you are treated as someone that isn't actually from the family. Okay, you're not a direct line of the seed, which seed is Christ. Okay. Um, and, and some of you are thinking, can he say that word? It's in the Bible. Okay, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Spirits and live. The spirit of his son. Live. Can you hear the Father Breathing that over you. The spirit of his son in you. Live. This is the heart of the father. <clears throat> for they, okay, last, I read that. No, verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And again, the word holiness is the word separate. And he's trying to separate you unto the, I'll say it like this, the father's business, the father's heart, the father's spirit, uh, the family spirit, the spirit of the lamb. He's trying to separate you, not just to perfection. Because there is, in his mind, in the father's mind, there is no perfection except Jesus. But when I say that, I don't mean there's none. Per there's nobody that's perfect except Jesus. That's, that's, that didn't come from the Father. <laughs> He's not the one going. No wonder you mess up. There's none perfect but Jesus. In his mind, he's not pleased with Jesus because of his perfection. Jesus is perfectly what he wants. He is the, what does it say in Colossians? He is the son of the father's love. Am I preaching the book that you're working on that we're working on? <laughs> he is the son of the father's love. That's the actual translation there in Colossians 1. For that. 12, I think. <laughs> And check it out, Lindsay. You always do, so let me know. Because I don't want to want to send people on a wild goose chase. The sun, what does it say? The yeah, I think so. No, no, it should be before or after that then. And it's translated the son of the father's love. It is, what is the real word? His dear son. Yeah. What verse is it? Or did you find it? Ah, well, that's crazy. I, I think it's either 12 or 13, 11, something right along in there. Anyway, um, 13. Okay, it wasn't that far away. <laughs> it's like, this is so far. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> and I'm very thankful that you looked these things up for me. Okay. Colossians 1 13. She's a, a sweetheart. Lindsay. She's a sweetheart. Let it go on the record for all eternity as this video goes up on the internet and stays there until everything goes dark. <laughs> until everything goes dark in 2016. <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> Just kidding. All right. Um, For, let's say he does it for our profit. Now, oh, I don't. I'm not. I, I could get off into some stuff, and it'd be it would be edifying. But there's so much here. Okay. Uh, notice that it didn't say God does this so you will be holy. I mean, that's important. He's not trying to make you holy. He's trying to make you partaker of His. 
in every case. You know, Hebrews uh, chapter 3, I don't know what verse, we're not going to look it up, but, but it, talks about, it talks about being partakers of Christ, that if you, you will be partakers of Christ if you hold steadfast, your, your confession steadfast to the end. Okay. Um, so that's, that's an important point. My God, we read this, we read this and, and we read it concerning ourselves instead of it being an action taken that makes us partake, partake of something that is him instead of us getting better. It's a big difference. It's a huge leap between one concept and another. You know, one of them is you working on you. The other one is you decreasing and him increasing. Uh, another way of saying it, better, you dead and him the life. Ah. We're having fun now, aren't we? Woohoo! All right, uh, verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised by it. All right, so he's trying and righteousness is also right relation with God and right relationship with God. Now Christ is made unto us wisdom, right relation, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. He's made unto us all these things. He is your peace. He is your, it just the scriptures go on and on and on in the New Testament that he is this, these things uh, in us and to us. Uh, so... Um, here he's saying it, it, it brings forth the peaceable fruit of right relation unto them who are exercised by it, meaning this has been worked in you, not just a concept that you've heard. God wants the living Christ. He doesn't want the knowledge of Christ only. He wants the living Christ. And, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me, well, you know, that, that's just a figure when it calls us the body of Christ. It's just a, you know. Well, the only, only way a person would say that is if they have no concept of God's concept called Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you don't know that, Caitlin, I like your T-shirt underneath there. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> if you don't, if 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 they don't know that, if I don't know that, if you don't know that, then there's only one other basis, folks, that we're operating off of, and that's the law. We're trying to measure up, and this is one reason why the Pharisees got so mad at people that didn't measure up because they worked so hard to measure up that it made them mad when others weren't working as hard as they were. Can I get amen? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Um, all right, so, and, and you know, I like this next verse too, so we'll read it and finish this. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. All right. People go, oh no, have, have I failed of the grace of God? Folks, first of all, I want you to consider how do you fail grace? That's the only way. That's the only way is to live by the law. Thank you. It's the only way. Because great, you know, and it, what it, in Romans 5, doesn't it say that it uses the word superabundance of grace? That we shall reign in life through one, through Jesus Christ. And, uh, and to him that receiveth. Abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Those who receive the free gift of grace. Paul, 
it's funny where grace is, is, is written in. Paul, in uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I think it's the very next verse says, I do not make void the grace of God. What grace? That I'm dead. And that he's my life. That's the grace he's talking about. It's not grace for your salvation. It's grace for your death. <laughs> but your salvation is Christ, your life. He's, you know, he's your salvation. All right. So, what do we say in that? I don't know. I'm sure it's good. Something. <laughs> There's something. No, what we're saying is this. That... <clears throat> The chastisement is not what people think it is. People think it's God jumping on you. Like, I don't know what your parents were like or your father was like. I don't know what mine was like. Boy. And it, and, it, and it didn't, he wasn't looking for right and wrong. He was looking for what suited him. And man, you didn't, if you didn't know what suited him, and a lot of times when you're a little kid, you don't know what suits an older guy, you know. Uh, you're in trouble. <clears throat> but the father is not walking around mad all the time. <laughs> the father is walking around looking for Jesus all the time. And he already put Jesus in those who are born again. Do you agree with that? If you're born again, you're born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth. Woohoo! You know, and God has already seen to it that you, would, each and every one of us, have Christ within us if we're truly born again. But now, now, He is at work as a Father, see, as a Father, and He is seeking that Christ be formed in you. You say, I thought I had Christ, and you do. You have an unformed Christ. You know, it's unformed in your understanding and in your being. It's like, well, I have Jesus, but I don't act like him. You know? Well, then what you have is a knowledge of Jesus, and your, your knowledge of him is probably more about the one seated at the right hand of God than it is the one that's in you. You know, you've learned, you've you know, and all that. Oh, Jesus, and he's coming back. Well, he's right here. I mean, he is. He's right here. And, and yes, okay, well, come on back if that be the case. But, you know, I know one thing. I am in constant contact with the living Christ and the Holy Spirit and my Father right now. And it's all just like always going. It's like, a well that bubbles up. It's, you know, and I know that's not everyone's experience because everyone hasn't, you know, you know, is, everyone is not as ancient as I am. But I tell you what, it has paid off the years and the, and the desire and the hunger because, I mean, I, honestly, I could just break down and cry right now because of the beauty of the Lord just, just today. And if you asked me that yesterday, I'd tell you the same thing. Uh, Every day I don't see something wonderful, but I do a lot, <laughs> and it's always him, and it's always just, you know, better than I deserve, better than you deserve. It is by grace, and it's, it's wonderful. All right, so <clears throat> uh, the Father, which by the way, Robert, you're teaching on Sunday, uh, so funny. I was in the exact same scriptures as you were, particularly that last one in John chapter 20. And the Lord had just, it was one of those days, just a few days ago, he just poured a whole lot of that into me. <clears throat> so I enjoyed, I enjoyed your sharing. It was really good. <clears throat> um, all right. So let me just see if there's anything we need to say.
Yeah, there is something here. Let me just read a, a short paragraph here. It says, when chastisement comes, some Christian, I'm, I'm putting in a few words there, some Christians fight it all the way and never learn the lesson that is to be learned by the chastisement. They fight the Father thinking that he's the devil. They call upon the Father who is chastising them to save them from his chastisement. I wonder how our Father puts up with us at times. That's, I actually wrote that. You know why I wrote that? I wonder why, how he puts up with us sometimes. You know, we're, I mean, we're basically calling the Father the devil. Because, you know, well, this is the devil. And, you know, he's going, no, this is love, whom he loves, whom he receiveth. I love you, I receive you. Father, save me from this wicked creature. That wicked creature is me. I wonder how our Father puts up with us at times. All right. Um, <clears throat> now let me, uh, uh, there's a couple of statements in the paragraph after that. It's like the third paragraph that's on page 29. Um, and I make this statement, chastisement may come because we are walking in sin, contrary to his holiness, or it may be because we are w walking in our own holiness. Here's the deal. The truth of the matter is, is that God is separated unto Christ. And we'll get that book out at, at conference time to really show uh, that reality. But it is, um, with him, sin is not Christ. Do you agree? With him, a lot of your good ideas is not Christ either. A lot of your sincerity may not be Christ. A lot of your plans for glory <laughs> may not be Christ. For him, he's not just like, I'm, I'm sorry, a phrase comes to my right mind, a sin snoop. He's not just snooping around looking for sin in people. He's just as upset with what is not Jesus that is really good off of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He's just as upset with that as he is that what's evil. It doesn't matter to him. He said, don't eat of either side of that. He, you know, he wants his son. He put his son into us. And, and that's the, you know, that's the parable. You know, he gave gave, you know, one man this many talents, and he gave this one this many talents, and he gave this one this many talents, and so he called him in, and the last one that he gave, what, 10 talents to, he brought back, and he said, look, I've got this much more, and he goes, yay, more Jesus, and he comes back, and the second one, he says, well, you gave me five talents, so now I have 10, and he goes, oh, you, you increased it, not as much as that guy, but you did increase Christ, yay, you know, and then the other guy comes in, and he goes, I got exactly what you gave me. I hid it, I hid Jesus away, and there's no increase of him, but I was really good while I was down there, if you will. And, and look how angry the father gets in that parable. It's like, I wanted an increase, I wanted my son, and I don't, I don't get any back from you. What does that tell you? It tells you the Father's commitment to us is in relationship to his Son. And guess what? And it's a covenant commitment. It's called a new covenant. I've given you a new heart. I've given you my heart. It's this heart. It's written into that heart. The old covenant, it was written on tables of law, external to you, and now you have to do it. So his commitment is to Jesus, and his commitment is to us to bring us into the fullness of Christ. But that's going to cost us. It is. It's going to cost us. And that cost is going to be us. It will... Um, 
it will require a deeper sensitivity than what we all have. Um, even recently, you know, sometime uh, a couple of weeks ago or whatever, I don't even remember now, I just remember there was a, a move of the Lord and I was sharing, it might have even been a Sunday night a month ago or something, and there was a, a word from the Lord about becoming more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Anybody remember that? Which well, It was a Sunday night. Um, and I, you know, I was with the Lord in that, but you know, when, when you're with the Lord in something like that, when he says it, we don't know what he's talking about pertaining to us yet. You know, I mean, he, he'll put his finger on it later. All we need to know is we're not as sensitive as we need to be. <clears throat> and my desire was just to be more sensitive. Now, this is going to sound funny to you, and, you know, or, you know, not funny, haha, -ha, but, you know, something. But over the last month or so, when that happened, when I am hearing from the Lord, I mean, I'll be reading the scriptures, and, you know, He does this all the time. Uh, I'll either have a pen and paper there or my iPad, and I just. He will say a sentence to me, and my mind will wander as to the meaning of that sentence or something, or I'll be slow to put it down. And by the time I get to the end of the sentence, I can't remember how the last part went. And the Spirit says, I want you to concentrate and keep up with me. I want you to focus on what I'm saying and not let your mind go off on these little things. And I thought, I thought, I have never, I have never really treated the Lord in a way that would say, like a, like a, and I'm, I'm just putting it this in a certain way, like someone worthy of, uh, if they're dictating, I need to pay attention. It would all, it would go more in the realm of, you know, yes, Holy Spirit, what does someone need? You know what I mean? I'm being sensitive now. Oh, oh you need a touch from for your, your, you know, bursitis or something, whatever. You know, oh, see, I'm being more sensitive. But he's saying, look, I, I'm faster than you. I know this because I told you the same way. I'm faster than you. And, you. and I'm always, my whole existence with you is always trailing back down to where you're at in your speed. And I... You know, you said you wanted to be more sensitive to me, so just try to stay with me. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's the Lord, and it's what's been going on in my life. And I'm going, you know what? I'm I am sorry, and I stop every time I do it. Now, you know, and there's three times in the last two days that I've done it. You know, I'd get, you know, I'd get off, and then I'd forget that last part, and and I'd go, you know, however he said that, that would impact somebody. And I don't remember, so I'm going to write down the best thought I have. I am sorry, Lord, that I am not going, man, I'm with you. Let's go with your speed now. You know, let, let's, you, you lead instead of me lead from the rear. Or as the rear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that it be according to your flow and not according to my, uh, disabilities, meaning being human instead of being with the Lord. <laughs> ah. Sorry for that little thing, but I mean, I, I, that, that is the Holy Spirit working on me and going like this, and he does it regularly now, and he'll go, hey, hey, you know, get with me here now, you know, and I'll go, yes, I want to be with you. Okay, well, you know, Okay, five years ago, it, it might have been more drastic, or two months ago, maybe it was something else. But my Father's heart and the Holy Spirit's heart, they do this for my profit, for our profit. Amen. And we're better off not dragging God down to our level all the time. I know we have to a lot. We have to. We're not there. But... I don't want to. 
and I want him to know I don't want to, and I stop when I do those off things, and I just say, forgive me right now. I'm so sorry. I wasn't paying attention as close as I should have been to your words. You know, it's like if somebody's talking to you and you drift off and go, well, you know, the laundry and da-da-da, and tomorrow I've got to, oh, you see, you know, and you pick back up, you know, about three paragraphs down, and you, know, you go, now how does that fit in with what you were saying before, you know? <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> All right, so um, what got me off on all that is that it's really not about sin, therefore chastisement. It is also about good. It is also about um, creative ideas. It's also about uh, sincerity. Anything that is not Christ, it is like the sacrifice that... The Lord says, don't add honey to this. <laughs> you know, don't add your honey into this. You know, let it all be Christ. And um, so may the Lord, may the Lord um, have even more place in our hearts. And may we be more sensitive. And may we genuinely want this to be real instead of just feeling good because maybe we're in a place that we feel the presence of the Lord or we feel that this is the word, that this is the true word of God on some front or whatever. I'm just trying to use words to say whatever comforts our flesh is not enough. Even spiritual things that comfort our flesh. If we want the Lord, we're going to have to give up a part of us all the time, you know. Take it, Lord. You know, when we first got saved, we gave him all of our stuff. And we go, well, I'm doing good now. I've given him all the, the stuff, you know. And he goes, now, okay, now we're going to work on you. He said, you got rid of your stuff. It took you two years to get rid of your stuff. It'll take you the rest of your life to get rid of you. <laughs> because we're so full of ourselves, you know. And we're so convinced that our ideas are better than anyone else's. See, now that's not... That's not um, identifiable when there's no situation going on. When it's just us and we're just sitting in our living room and, you know, whatever. Uh, our ideas can be better than everybody else's, but we don't think like that. We don't go, oh, my idea. Well, some of you do. But anyway. <laughs> oh, my ideas are better than everybody else's, you know. <laughs> But get in a situation where somebody else comes up with an idea and you go, well, that's stupid. You know, you know if it's totally stupid, it's, that's worse than stupid in you. That's not Christ. <laughs> you know, so Jesus say, you're stupid. I love you. Come up here in my lap because you're stupid. <laughs> you are not living by Christ. And I'm going to chastise you because... <laughs> You're, you claim to be a son by Christ, you know. Well, what about him? You hear any of that? That's what, that's what Peter said about John. Well, what about him? Don't worry about him. You focus on, you know. All right. So, you know, I really planned on covering two of these chapters uh, in this first hour. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to go ahead and stop, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll come back to page 33 after the break. Take a break.